time. I think we should do the question and answer. How would you like to run that? I mean, or me to run it? Okay, yeah, fine. Um, so, who would like to have a question for one of our wonderful... Oh, we've got a roving mic at the back, I think. Nice. Already got a volunteer. Thanks so much for everything you guys have said. Um, I wanted to touch on something you guys raised, which is that we're just not getting there as fast as we should and that some of those issues around women stepping up and maternity leave and all of these, we've really done so much to address. And um, I'm in the high academic sector, university sector, and you know, for 30 years we've been getting people to step up, um, but they're still not getting the positions. Mm. So there is this issue, and I love your story, that when you put in a quota and then you looked at who got the positions, they were equal. Yep. Mm -hmm. You control all the academic sector yeah. because they totally depend on government yeah. funding. The National Health Medical Research Council, yeah. who's entirely your organisation, for every one female fellow this year, yep. there were eight male at professor level. Now at all the other levels, 50-50, yeah. because they're working for the professors, yeah? So workforce-wise, again, 80% female, yeah, but surely you can quota that overnight. You'll be pleased to know that universities are subject to the gender equality bill that will be going through the parliament later this year. That'd be cool. It's interesting because Given I, I just find it fascinating because they're created think out think of state academics statute. and academy yeah. is progressive. It's amazing when you read those statistics. Mm. <laughs> decision makers, decision makers. So if the decision makers are your C, your C suite, did you go? I don't know that term, yeah, but I, I love it. Was it top of the special pass? The C suites, I don't know. The either. decision makers make the decisions. So if your decision making is in the C suite, and yes. the C suite is ninety percent male, mm -hmm. not for any fault of anyone trying to do the wrong thing, but that unconscious bias can mean at that level. Yeah. But, you know, NHMRC is a beautiful one because how on earth could that happen? Yeah. A one to eight ratio of professors, mm. how, how could the government mm. watch that happen and not do anything about it? Mm. The interesting thing on the unconscious bias stuff that you touched on too is it's actually the bias that is off, often operating is um, totally at odds with the reality. So, for example, the very cohort of women that are often most discriminated against in, the, in employment processes are also the very cohort of women that were proven to be the most productive in the workforce, and that is women with young children. So often when they come up uh, for review in a, in a recruitment process, the view will be they'll be unreliable, they'll be called away from work all the time, um, they'll have other demands, and they're gonna be less committed. In fact, what was shown was that they had less time uh, to faff around, so yeah. when they were at work, <laughs> they got what they needed to get Absolutely. done because they didn't have the luxury of being able to swan around with cups of tea in the yeah. evening and work at their own pace, uh, which, which is often what happens. You know, they didn't have the choice to be unproductive because, because they had the luxury of thinking, I can make up time at the end of the day. They can't. So in the hours they're there, they're far more productive. So the interesting thing about the unconscious bias is it's not even accurate. It's, um, it, it's, it's quite wrong. Uh, so you could ask a busy person. Yeah, yeah. that's absolutely right. Busy person. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your learnings uh, very honestly. <laughs> um, I've got a question again. Sorry. That's yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. So no, it's a funny mic. That one I, I tried like this. Yeah, do you want to yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I've got a question around the uh, gender equality. Mm -hmm. uh, so you say that um, the scope is really uh, obviously the public sector, uh, which is great. I think that's a first step, and I think it's around 10 percent of the Italian yeah, about population. 11 or 12. Yep. Yeah. Um, but what's your plan for the private sector? Mm. Uh, what can you do in terms? What are the best practices? That so without giving too much away about the bill, because it's still <laughs> being drafted, ah. um, there will be some mechanisms that look to how. Uh, government uses it, the levers at its disposal around procurement and the expectations, which obviously means, you know, government is a big purchaser of, of goods and services, uh, which obviously, you know, and obviously you end up with quite a number of businesses who want to be considered um, for, for government contracts, so encouraging them to think about it through those sorts of mechanisms, and I think there's room for us to, to grow in that space in terms of what we encourage in the private sector. And the other part of it is, um, is what we model and what we send a very clear message that we expect of others and we shouldn't, um, shouldn't underestimate the power of that. 
Obviously, our, our direct levers on the private sector are, are, um, are less than what they are in the public sector, obviously. But where we can, I think there is a conscious effort in, in this bill and, uh, and through our procurement policies, through other mechanisms as well across government, I've got to say I'm not the only one in Cabinet that has an eye to this. Um, this government's been, uh, had a particular focus up until now around social procurement, around making sure that our government dollars are spent on, on uh, enterprises that actually have social value as well as economic value to us. So that's sort of one area where we've been trying to use procurement to, to um, deliver to us more benefits than just the, the, the stock standard kind of cheapest price you know, kind of arrangements, but actually have flow on effects for the community as well. Uh, obviously through the GE bill we'll be having, we'll be exploring options about how we can uh, send a clear message around gender. Uh, but I do know that there's sort of work going, going on with other uh, portfolios too about how we uh, more appropriately uh, lever the, or, you know, lever the um, outcomes that we know we want as a community through our procurement power, if you like. So that, that's one, one of our probably strongest options available to us. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. no, up one, the back, two, three, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you everyone for the very exciting insights. I have a question that I think Wendy mentioned. How do you manage backlash from being seen as strategic or competitive or aggressive? <laughs> <laughs> Everything that's good in men, but when women does it, yeah. I, I do realise yeah, that people yeah. start seeing women who are like that with wary eyes. So how do you manage that? Because it does affect relationships and how you're being perceived in the workplace. Mm. Thank you. Very good question. Yeah. Can I add one more thing to that list potentially? Is passionate as well. We were yes. talking a bit before that, you know, what are the cues you get for what you can and can't say in different environments? And I think often, you know, and I think it happens in politics as well. There's kind of a model of how you're supposed to communicate yourself. And if you try to change the models of politics and representation, and I would argue that we need a different model because our models aren't working very well um, with the unsolved problems before us and you bring something new to the table, mm. often you know, you're know you dismissed or you're ignored. That's often a powerful tool. I mean, media have a lot of power in terms of the exposure they give you because we interact with the media as an you know, oh, important yeah. channel to get our messages across. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of power there and they can often give you, they have a lever there in terms of the cue they give you what you can and can't say to get their exposure. And I often find that I think if you're passionate and driven about something and you want to create quite transformational change, just not tinker around the edges, you know, you're often given those, um, that feedback around, you know, that's not, you know, that's not how we do it in many ways. And I think that's one thing I've experienced oh, in the last couple of years. described as shrill. That's, that's right. A, a term shrill. that wasn't often dealt with a hated oh, word. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. And um, yeah. so if you're seen as overly aggressive or competitive yeah. and, you know, that doesn't fit the performer of how you're supposed to behave and, you know, that's, mm. I think the, the challenge is that we have to keep doing it, not make any apologies for it. Yeah. And you find that, I think also, that it, then it's a catalyst for it. The change can then happen quite quickly afterwards. Once mm. again, I think I benefited from women doing that in the public sphere before me, and then it didn't become a thing. And you know, people like Gillard, who had experienced such incredible vitriol. Well, what to her when she, absolutely. And she wasn't even, you know, she wasn't breaking things. No, that's she was right. She just yeah. speaking her truth. That's which right. many people agreed had a lot of weight behind it. That's right. Yeah. And then they came for her personally. That's and right. that frightened a lot of women, I That's think. Right. Oh, and yeah. people exploited what was kind of in the underbelly of our cultural norms, right? It sits there and uh, some people in the public sphere really exploited that and could use that to then create a huge opposition mm. to someone who was carving incredible new, you know, incredible yeah. progress for women. Yeah. I want to comment on it in terms of um, competitiveness within my colleagues and to get pre-selected, the whole process of pre-selection in the Liberal Party is extremely competitive and the more um, safe a seat it is, not that there are terribly many that are, means that you know, that competition is very fierce. So from day one, you're thrown into this very competitive environment and find out that actually most of the people who be pre-selected and get elected are in themselves extremely competitive. Now, as Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party, my role is around the people stuff and keeping all of the people together. And we have a lot of people with um, strong egos and who are very competitive. And that's the nature of who turns up in Parliament. It wouldn't be any different in your parties mm -hmm. at all. That, uh, you know, everyone, the women are competitive and the men are competitive. And to try and 
channel that and funnel that so that everyone is you know on the same page going forward mm. um, you know takes a fair bit of um, leadership and work to so and management can I ask people. a blunt and probably tactless question did all the stuff that happened federally um, around Julia Banks saying women were being bullied on, on gender basis and others standing up behind her, did that scare women off from trying to compete in the pre-selection race? Do you, mm. Does it? I don't think it did. Some people who may be not long-time members of the party who a lot of people um, who are with liberal values might be working in professional jobs and then perhaps to leave their job to come, you know, some of them might think, oh, maybe I'm okay where I am. Whereas if you've been part of the fabric for a longer time, and brought along, yeah, 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 brought along. Yeah. Can I add something to the question that was asked too at the back? Um, one of the things that's probably taken me a while to be comfortable with was um, looking at the sort of modes of, of confrontation and aggression that were being modelled around me in politics, largely by men, feeling a great discomfort with carrying myself in the same way because it doesn't come naturally to me and then working out somewhere along the line that I didn't need to do it their way, that I could, mm, I could do it my own way, way. Uh, and that we shouldn't necessarily try and model the modes that are modelled to us because a lot of the times they're quite unhealthy uh, and, and in fact undesirable. Bad and for your blood pressure. Yeah, bad for your blood pressure but they're often the very modes of aggression and confrontation that make the public turn away from politicians too, yeah. quite frankly. They're, they're, they're modelled and, and people just shut off. Um, so once I think I sort of came to this realisation that I could have the same outcome, uh, I could negotiate the same outcome, I could sometimes negotiate a better outcome by operating in a mode that I felt comfortable with, while not standing down, doesn't require, didn't require me to be at all, um, you know, uh, well, it didn't re require me to quieten myself at all but it was just about approach. Um, that really helped me, I think, deal with, um, uh, with a, a lot of the sort of noise that you're, that you're talking about. In saying that, um, and this is not just true of me, um, there's probably many of us, at least a couple I can think of. One of the things for women, I think, in politics is that, that still persists, even if people don't speak about it, is the tendency to want to um, judge a woman by the predominant male relationship in her life, so in my case my yeah. husband, yeah. Um, who was a federal politician uh, and, and significantly older than me. So I came into Parliament understanding very clearly that there was a view that I'd got there because of him. Um, and it wouldn't have mattered how accomplished I was, uh, that was going to be the view that was held. So I walked in feeling like I had to work ten times as hard as everyone else to get half as far. That's how I felt. Now, others would say that's not the reality, but it's certainly how I felt. So I spent the, certainly spent the first term buckling down and making sure I understood as much as I could about everything that was going on, that I was taken seriously in every room, that every contribution was thoughtful and um, that the relationships that I was building were, um, were fruitful and genuine and authentic uh, because I felt that mattered and poured my heart and soul into that and then one day I was walking through the corridors in Parliament and a colleague came over. I kept myself pretty busy doing that too, I've got to say, and uh, he walked past me and said, you, um, you know, it might help you if you... Um, <laughs> said it It'd be really nice to see you smile more often. Oh, God, that's the oh most... And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and maybe... A lot of playing into a trope. I know, I know. It's practically I know. a mother's thing. It was, it was a amazing. lot of stereotypes in there, like just oh, yeah, so many. With, with, yeah, really yeah, work with and them. then the <laughs> other part, though, was, you know, so it was a bit of, you know, why don't you smile, you know, which is just awful. But then, <laughs> but, but then it was, but then it was um, you know, and, you know, uh, and then often it was like, oh, and some, some of the, the MPs gather for coffee and, you know, they might like, you know, you might like to sort of join people for coffee more often, you know, be a bit more social. In my workplace, work. you know, That's like, right. <laughs> like right. it's in, a, in a place of work. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's quite you know, interesting. We've all known so. when we've reached equality, reached equality when a woman goes up to a young man yeah. in, who's making a new career, right. yeah. you know, in politics and says, look, probably would help you to smile a bit smile. more. <laughs> and you should come and join us for coffee. You know, like, <laughs> mm, oh, I know. It's hilarious. I yeah, have done yeah. stuff like that. Oh, good. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not going to strike a blow for equality. No, 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 that's right. Um, now we've probably got time. Oh, yeah, we've probably got another couple of minutes. Maybe. Um, I've got to go in a second. Oh, so is that the end? One more that's question. One question each. I've got to go. Enjoying myself too much. I'm really happy to see you. Go on. Oh, thank you. 
Um, so just building on what we've just been discussing um, and how women do approach things differently and I think they bring something different to the Ooh, table yeah. yep. and it's not always valued. I think we have some very patriarchal mm. structures and values in our workplace. Um, how have you found it, because you know, you, you're know you sort of talking about working in environments where there are a lot of strong women. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested to see how you found it versus maybe environments where there weren't oh, as many. Can and I grab this one first? Mm. Yeah. And whether, like, do you find that the, the organisation is valuing the fact that your mm. input and your approach is, in fact, different? Different, yeah, sure. Mm. It's a very different question, and it's about targets versus quota mm -hmm. mm. and, and the gender equality bill, because I think the, the evidence is out there that targets don't work, only quotas. Mm. Yep. Mm. Thank you. I might have to take that one as a comment because I'm at risk of giving too much away about the bill before it's gone through appropriate processes. But um, in, in relation to the first um, uh, question, um, which is around how, that, how that's modelled, you made me immediately think about um, having more women in Cabinet and what I think the impact of that has been in terms of the way, say, a Cabinet has operated, but it also in terms of the way we've executed a policy agenda. Um, I'm, always it pains to say to people, this isn't a symbolic exercise. Having more women at decision-making tables is not about symbolism, it's about outcomes. And I think we've seen that in the last five years with the Victorian state government. Every, and to demonstrate that, I'd make this point. Um, the boldest reform agendas that have been pushed through in the past five years, whether you agree with them or not, because some of them have been very publicly challenging, whether it be voluntary assisted dying or medicinal cannabis, or indeed in a level crossing removal, some of the big infrastructure projects, Virtually all of those groundbreaking reforms have been driven by women. So my observation is that women have, have made uh, our government braver, far braver, and their voices around the table have been brave. That's not often a, a word you hear associated with feminine influence, um, but I can absolutely say a lot of the issues that were um, pursued and delivered upon were things that have been kicking around the political agenda for decades mm -hmm. and never dealt with. And the minute that we had a more equal representation of women around the decision-making table, they were dealt with. Yeah. And not just on women's issues, on government issues across the board. And, you know, largely very well executed along the way. It was a bravery in bringing the discussion to the public. It was a bravery in giving, paying people the respect, of, um, the, the respect of presenting them with an option and, and hearing opinion and then, you know, pursuing an outcome. Uh, so I'd say what's been really interesting about watching... Uh, a government operate with far more women involved and far more women involved at very high levels has been watching the outcomes follow from that, um, but also watching, uh, I think in recognition of the fact that the outcomes have been so profound, is watching um, the debate around a table change mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the way that debate's carried out, the way um, women convey ideas and argue. Uh, and, and on the occasion that women do need to uh, step into modes of confrontation that we might associate with being more masculine, for want of a better word, it's often got more impact uh, because it's not used gratuitously, um, it's used very strategically and, and, uh, and so much of, uh, of the approach uh, and the um, thoughtfulness of policy, uh, you know, I, th I think that that approach, that thoughtfulness has really lifted the performance of the whole group. Women are about outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would either of our other panellists like to speak to that or we, what, we wrap up? Yeah, I need to. Need, need to go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks for having us. I've really enjoyed meeting all of you and the conversation's definitely enriched my day. Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.